today a little bit about wealth and economics. How many of you have taken Econ or are taking Econ 201 or something like that? How many of you? Or have taken it in high school? Wow, a lot in high school. Um, we've talked a lot in the past about how uh, well, we talked about how uh, Europeans have spread around the world. The cover of Guns, Germs, and Steel and many other places we can have shows the priest with the cross <coughs> who is sanctifying, who's justifying in the name of religion the horrible things that are going on, at least from the, my perspective, horrible things that are going on in the foreground. The duplicity and the the rapaciousness of the Spaniards taking away uh, all this stuff that belongs to the people who were living in the Americas at that time and doing so with the justification of the church in the background. Now, what happened to both the old world and the new world we're in the new world, the old world is Europe, with respect to gold, when the Spaniards especially, but also the Portuguese and the French and the Dutch and so forth, came to the new world. Basically, what happened? The Bill? Gold, the gold went from here to there. The gold went from here to there. Now, this is a church in Italy, in Siena. Uh, how many of you have been to a church in Spain or Italy or France? And, and what do you see when you go inside the church? A lot of beautiful things, right? Sometimes extraordinary craftsmanship. But you also see a lot of gold. Where you really see a lot of gold and a lot of incredibly beautiful craftsmanship in stone and wood is in the Vatican in St. Peter's in Rome. Why, where did this gold come from? <coughs> the Americas, largely, because that was the time a lot of these cathedrals were built. So what was, what was the cost of getting that gold into these cathedrals? Probably killed some people. How about some millions of people? The cutting of the forest to make the fish, to make the ships that they came across. <laughs> <laughs> that they came across on. Uh, clearly many young Spanish, mostly men, were lost in battles, in, in very difficult ship situations, even in the construction. But most of the cost was in the lives of the people in the Americas. And I'm going to show you uh, what that has meant a little bit later in this talk. But in the process, this an enormous amount of gold was brought back to the New World and silver. Now, the Old World, when all this gold came in, they doubled the amount of gold in the Old World, in Europe. Now, since gold was wealth, obviously, even today, you can buy a lot of stuff if you've got some gold. See some of you with gold uh, jewelry on. I've got gold in my teeth and on my wedding ring. Um, if you have this, they should have become much more wealthy, right? They had much more gold. <coughs> but what happened, in fact, was that this, when the Spanish brought back this gold from the New World, a tremendous cost to the people of the of the New World, they doubled the quantity of gold in the Old World, but they halved its value. Now the question for today, the first question for today is why was the gold halved in value and what relation does that have to the economics of today? The second question for today will be, where does our wealth come from now, and what can we expect about the future 
of our wealth. And this comes back, all of the course comes back to those first two readings that we did on the first day. Do we have an optimistic view of the future or a pessimistic? What would optimistic mean? What would pessimistic mean? Okay, now, why do you think it was that when the Spaniards brought <coughs> back all this gold and doubled the amount of gold in Europe, did it halved in value? Yes? Well, if you flood the market with anything, the value is going to decrease. If you flood the market with anything, the value is going to go down. And from a commodity perspective, <coughs> you could have said gold is just a commodity. And it didn't have a lot of real use. Just make things pretty, but it didn't have a lot of use. Yeah, that's an idea. But you, by flooding the market with iron and wood, people got richer. Right? You've been making that point. And the agricultural production, isn't that simple? Yes? Is it because either all the gold went to the upper class or the lower class couldn't afford it? So the Boy, that's an interesting thing. I never thought about that. Well, the people brought back the coal from the gold from the uh, New World were both upper class and a lot of, a lot of sort of medium law. When did Ferdinand and Isabel When the Ferdinand and Isabel and not and Right now, where's that gold now? It all ended up in the church. You got you to think of, the, at that time, the Catholic Church, and I don't want to pick on Catholics because the Protestants did it too, but they were more powerful. The Catholic Church uh, was an economic and political player and a military player throughout most of that time. Yeah? Um, they took a lot of their wealth and put it into ships and sailors and taking over North and South America. So they pretty much converted all that value. They put in so much and they got out so much and they didn't really change the amount of wealth. They just changed its form. Oh, you're getting very, very close. Well, what would happen if in the United States today we, um, the government decided to print twice as much money? Would that make us twice as rich? Yeah, uh, probably make the value have. So gold, many people think gold is some absolute standard of wealth, but it's, it's just a medium of exchange. People have agreed to use it as a medium of exchange as we agree to use a $20 bill for a medium of exchange. What is the real wealth that was being produced in Europe at that time? Ships. Building ships and what do you do with land? Harvesting. Agricultural production, okay. Mines, Force, resources, who said resources? Good, that's the point. Resources. Wealth comes from resources. Wealth doesn't come from gold. It doesn't come from financial shenanigans as we find out in Enron. Enron does uh, all this, these financial uh, shenanigans, but there was not very much real wealth behind it. And that's, it, it, all of this still goes on. All of this still goes on. And that's one of the principal points I want to make today, and we're going to come back to that. The production of wealth in Europe was based upon the production of the land, of the forests, and the agriculture, and the fisheries was a function of the mine, the people getting in there and digging out some useful metal like iron, or maybe some less useful uh, metal like silver, uh, was a function of the cutting of the forests and using them for fuel, the construction of water power to allow you to have more energy to do different economic things like grinding grain. It was the hard work of farmers in the fields and the hard work of women at home doing the weaving to produce wealth, which would be clothes. This is how wealth is produced. The gold at that time, which was their money, or the money we use today, is just a means that we've agreed to use to keep track of it, a medium of exchange. So the point I want to make here today, first point, is that wealth comes basically from resources. Now, some people argue that wealth just comes from the human mind, that they come up with cleverer and cleverer ways to do things. Well, that can be important too. And I don't want to go into it. I teach a whole course on this at, uh, at the 500 level. But 
when you look at that, you find out basically people's clever ideas of enhancing wealth basically are means of throwing more energy at exploiting the resources. I don't want to particularly get into that today, but I do want to make the point, yes, indeed, the human creativity is very important, but most of this creativity requires energy to back it up, and we began to talk about that in the last lecture, and we're going to talk about that some more in today's lecture. So let's do a, a quick little review here of what's going on with a focus on Europe and North America. First thing, human population, whoo, now we're talking about this region, is starting to increase a great deal. In England, the English for a long time were particularly wealthy on the scale of the world, especially in around, here's 1850 to 1950 a time during which the English became very rich, or at least some upper class English, maybe 100,000 people. And this, their, their energy use per capita went from, can't read, can't read the units here. Can you read the units on the slide? Well, whatever the energy units are, from about 0.5 to about 6, so it increased by a factor of 12 or so, per person during this time period. Now, you, what we say, what we've often said is that in the past, the rich have needed the poorer people, some people call them lower classes, I don't like that term, just as good folks, they're just in a different economic situation. The, the rich have used the poor to hew, that means chop, Hew their wood and haul their water. How many have heard of that term, hew the wood and haul the water? Well, okay, now, you don't hew any wood, probably. I do a little, same you, some of you do a little, or haul much water. It's done for us. It's done for us by energy slaves. And in fact, each of you, as a more or less average American, <coughs> has about 80 energy slaves working for you day after day after day. Pumping the water to the top of, of your uh, dorm, providing heat in your dorm, growing your food. Takes about a gallon of oil a day to grow the average food that you eat. Now, all of this takes place somewhere else, so you don't see it very much. Occasionally you see energy if you fill up the gas tank of a car or something like that. Normally, you don't even think about it. In the past, when there weren't energy slaves, there were human slaves. It's not worthwhile having human slaves anymore because it can be done more cheaply with the energy slaves that we have. And that's what was happening as England became much, much more wealthy. Um, when India threw off the British in 1947, somebody said to Gandhi, their great leader, so one of his lieutenants said to him, oh boy, now we, we got rid of the British who had been uh, sitting on top of the Indians for 100 years. He said, now we'll be as rich as the Brits. And Gandhi said, no way. Took half the resources of the world, the British Empire was half the world at one time, to make the British rich. We'll never own that resource base. Gandhi understood it. Many people understood it. Question is, the modern economists understand that. Well, we're going to talk about that for a while. Next. Um, the fuel, the, the, what's done by the human labor in the American economy, for example, from 1850 to 1950 and going on a little bit more, this is what's done by human labor, the percent. It's become trivial the actual energy of hammering something or sawing something or digging something. It become trivial. <coughs> this is the amount that was done by animals. And this is the amount that's done by coal, oil, and gas. Throw in a little <coughs> hydropower, a little bit of nuclear, and you got the whole ballgame. <coughs> well, some wood also, especially back then. 
So most of the work that's done to create wealth in our economy is done now by fuel, by fossil fuel. <coughs> fossil means simply old. So fossil fuel is the reason you have 80 slaves apiece. <coughs> you just turn on the light switch, start the car or whatever, have a glass of water somewhere, some pump is pumping that water up to the top of your building and providing you with a glass of water. Maybe also purifying it and treating it when you're done with it and so forth. Okay, next. <coughs> now, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about the cost of the European invasion to Mexico. Um, here is one estimate by Cook and Bora of the population of central Mexico that went from well, Mexico City now is 20 million people. We're talking about the same region, more or less. So we all know that Mexico City is one of the hugest cities in the world. It's both a gorgeous city and it's a horribly crowded, overused city, but it's, a, it's an incredible entity as a city. <coughs> so definitely I want to tell you, if you ever find yourself in Mexico City, go to the Museum of Anthropology there. It's one of the most incredible, beautiful, interesting museums I've ever seen in the world. So the number of people, when the Europeans came into central Mexico, the number of people went from about 17 million people, almost the population today, down to just one or two million. Why? Well, did the Spaniards kill 18 or 16 million people by the sword? Disease. Probably mostly disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guns, germs, and steel. Sort of an emphasis on germs, but it was more than that. It was the disruption, the destruction of the culture, the enslavement of the people, uh, the destruction of their own cultural systems that had allowed for the maintenance of this many people. The Spanish had no respect for the very sophisticated agricultural systems that were found in the New World. They let their horses out to graze, graze uh, and cows on pastures on these very beautifully engineered terrace landscapes. You can still see it if you fly just south of, of Mexico City. See this incredible terrace landscape that was destroyed by the Spanish animals. Because the Spaniards came from a savanna kind of grassland kind of ecosystem. They had no particular experience, many of them, the northern Spanish at least, with the kind of sophisticated agriculture that the Aztecs, even the Aztecs, who some say were the thugs of Mexico, but they had a very sophisticated agricultural system there, and it was just destroyed. The whole culture was turned up and down, and of course many of the people were killed immediately and directly when they were made slaves, and they were uh, put to work getting the gold, <coughs> much of which was uh, went directly to the Catholic Church, if you want to think about that a little bit. So <coughs> what happened then? Well, Mexico was essentially depopulated for some time. Its population has grown up. Now, of course, it's gone up again. Many, many civilizations as we've implied before, go up and down, the number of people. My own sense is when you ride on the Mexico City subways, which is a gorgeous subway system, that about uh, 70 or 80 percent of the genes of the people that you're looking from are from the Americas, and about 30 percent roughly are from Europe. So um, maybe who won? I don't know. Everybody, nobody. Just history. Next. Now, I want to take this background of the necessity of resources for real wealth, the exploitation of the Americas for this false wealth of gold, and I want to kind of update it. Now, uh, this is a very wonderful uh, magazine. If you read any business magazine, read this one. It, it's, it's funny, it's sophisticated, it deals with the whole world. Um, you may or may not share in its cultural values, 
but it's a, a wonderful source of information for what's going on in the world, and, and they are uh, tongue-in-cheek on about everything, including the virtues of the kind of economics that are espoused by economists. And so what this, this is a court jester. He says, the show can't go on. And you can't read this very well, but I love Keynes. And then that's crossed out. That's a type of economics. Um, I love uh, monetarism. That's crossed out. I love pragmatism. I love anything. And there's supply side snake oil. These are all economic concepts that are coming <coughs> along. So economists. Sometimes they have a pretty hard time understanding what's going on in different parts of the world, including the U.S. now. You know, that how come the stock market is not recovering, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people worry about that. I think I got a pretty good idea, but we'll uh, go on from there. So, look, go back. Now, in your uh, Econ 201 course, virtually every Econ course, have you seen a, uh, how many have seen a graph something like this? You have, come on, put your hands up so I can tell. All right, those of you, about as many people take economics. This is the fundamental concept of how economists think about <coughs> economics today. The, the kind of economics that we do today is called neoclassical <coughs> economics. Classical economics was Adam Smith and Ricardo, guys we talked about last time. They focused on where does wealth come from. The neoclassical economists focus on markets. How is wealth distributed? They don't worry so much about it. We don't have to get into that in any detail. Uh, we do in some more advanced courses. But this basic diagram, which is fundamentally in the first chapter of virtually all Econ 201 uh, books, has the economy working like this. Here's households. Here's firms. <coughs> firms provide goods and services to households, and in return, households pay for the goods and services. You know, you go to the mall, you spend your stuff, you got to buy your goods and services, and, and they take your money. In exchange, the firms get land, labor, and capital from households. That's, that's your investment, your money in the bank, or money in the stock market, if you have any. They certainly get labor from households, and maybe they get land, and they pay wages and profits. Now, how many of you have had physics, fundamental physics? All right, you know those things in the Sunday newspapers, the Sunday funnies, how many things can you find wrong with this picture? Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture from the fundamental issues of physics? Yes, go. No. Breaks the second law of thermodynamics. Breaks the second law of thermodynamics. What? It, it has no energy to run it. That's the first thing that's obvious to me. Another way of saying it is it's a perpetual motion machine. This thing goes on and on and on, round and round and round and round, without any requirement for the energy to run it or the resources <coughs> from which the wealth is generated. So I want to tell you that I think the kind of economics they're teaching you is a lie. It's physically not possible. Now, somebody would say, and I had an economist say to me, but the laws of physics don't apply to economics, to social science. Excuse me. It's about stuff. And stuff must respect the laws of physics. So how can we take this fundamental idea about <laughs> economics and turn it into something that we as budding young scientists would, can, would not be ashamed to show in the company of other uh, scientists? Yes, ma'am. Isn't labor and like a lot of the different words up there isn't energy implied in the terms themselves? Like, I mean, not in that diagram. Is, is that well, the labor is there. Where's it come from? You got to feed labor. You got to provide the fuel to labor. Where's that? So you're saying that energy, like those terms, are just 
it turns and that energy is somewhere else and that's not in this back in this diagram. <coughs> Certainly not explicit. Okay. I don't like it. Now you can make up your own mind. Nobody is ever asked to go agree with Dr. Hall. You're asked to be able to argue your position, whatever it is, well, <coughs> if you want an A. Okay, so Herman Daly is one of a, a really wonderful economist who has <coughs> got one foot as in, in, the, in the natural world, in the world of ecology, and one world in the, or, and one foot in the world of economics. And he came up with this uh, first correction, and he said, here's the economic system, but the economic system with, with the cycling we saw before, and less represented in less detail here, must live within the global ecosystem. It has to have a continuous provision of fuels to make it work. And it must have a continual input of matter to make it work. And we've certainly been talking about wood and steel and uh, I suppose guns, these, these things that are produced by the economy. And it must dump out waste, heat, and degraded material. Often these we call pollutants. That's the first step in making our view of how an economy works consistent with the reality of the world rather than simply the minds of a few economists. The next step is something that uh, I did with some students, oh, Professor Hall's view of the minimum diagram we would have to make in order to accurately represent how real economic systems operate. Now, the first thing we need is what we call the maintenance of environmental prerequisites and amenities. Prerequisites means things that you absolutely need to begin, and amenities means the, the, the good conditions of life. And so, first we have energy sources. Most important is the sun, some geophysical, some nuclear from inside the earth. And here we have next raw materials. So we have the energy from the sun interacting with the raw materials of the earth's surface to generate natural ecosystems. Natural, natural ecosystems providing the conditions necessary to sustain life, all of the wonderfully diverse plants and animals of the planet, including those that we exploit. We have to have these. Now, the most important component of our economic system is the proper functioning of the water cycle. So the sun drives that. The sun evaporates the water, moves it around in mountains. Uh, how many of you live in New York City? What is New York City dependent upon for its water? Catskill. Catskill Mountains. The Catskill Mountains then, with the orographic effect we talked about in one of our early lectures, intercepts water that was evaporated from the Atlantic Ocean. It rains on the top of the uh, Catskill Mountains at an elevation that allows gravity feed to New York City so that New York City has the best quality water of any major city in the country. Because uh, we left the natural ecosystems intact, you go through the Catskills, it's basically covered with trees, and we better keep it that way. Now, in the past, some small portion of ecosystem net production got buried as fossil fuels. Now, the cultural transformations, cultural means we're starting to include humans. Exploitation, I've been using that word a lot. How humans have increasingly exploited the natural environment Exploitation, processing, uh, and manufacturing and consumption. Here's uh, exploitation is a, a barn, a tractor, a chainsaw, a dam, steam shovel, an oil well, etc. Processing is a butcher block, uh, uh, maybe a corn canning factory, a sawmill, a petroleum refinery, a power plant, etc. Manufacturing, here's somebody making food, timber, uh, steel beams, and then consumption. Now, neoclassical economics is basically only interested in this part of the system. It's missing all of the major elements. 
This is the minimum diagram, I think, we need to do to be able to represent what the economy actually does. And maybe we should discuss this. Maybe you want to disagree with me, and that's fine. Because I'll tell you, there's um, 100,000 economists out there that disagree with me. So we should think about that. Should economics be a social science where the only thing is important are people? Or do we have to think about the biophysical, the biological and physical world out there that is required to generate all these goods and services? So I told you before, so that if you buy a dollar's worth of, uh, you know, Valentine candies or, or whatever, that, you know, that bottle, that you are taking about somewhere in society for the average dollar's worth of stuff you buy, this much oil is taken out to generate the goods and services that are represented to make, that were necessary to make the dollar's worth of stuff that you bought. That's economics. That's what it really is. And to say it isn't is to hide from the truth. Yes, Horace. I have a question concerning the diagram. For instance, if you live in a modern society... Say it loud enough so they can um, hear. If you live in a modern society... You will tend to only look at the, the, the stuff that you're getting from. That's right. Stuff. You only look at what in this last bit, what's happening in the last little bit here. Yep. But if you were living in a society where you grow your food, you look at the... You bet. They understood where their goods and services came from. That's a good point. That's a good point. Certainly, many of our ancestors who we've been talking about earlier in the class understood this kind of economics, this biophysical economics, very, very straightforwardly. We've just been separated from the resources and the exploitation of the resources that are fundamental to our society. Yes? What do these modern economists say to you when you give them this theory of this? the resources of yeah. the world. What's um, explanation? Three things. Some of them say, right on, the minority. Um, some others fight me on detailed points, and uh, I would guess, in my opinion, I, in my opinion, I win about 80% of those battles. And the overwhelming vast majority don't even want to talk about it. So, um, I have, um, I have on my desk right now a letter from Nordhaus of Yale, one of the great neoclassical economists, and he says, well, I, I, I wrote this paper in which I brought a few copies. If any of you are particularly interested in it, I can give you a copy. And this was in bioscience in August. It's called The Need to Reintegrate the Natural Sciences with Economics. And so from this, I sent him this paper, and, and I, I said, what do you think? And he, he wrote me back a letter, and he says, well, I disagree with just about everything you say. Yeah. That's all he said. You know, no, nothing specific, nothing I can answer to, nothing I can argue with. Well, you know, if I'm coming along and then say, you spent your whole life learning neoclassical economics, and I tell you, in my opinion, in the opinion of the vast majority of scientists, not real, real scientists, natural scientists who have examined this issue, they are in complete agreement with me. Scientists natural scientists tend to be more or less completely in agreement with what I'm trying to say. So I say, hey, your whole life we think is, uh, you know, based on sand. Well, you know, it's not a good way to make friends and influence people. Okay? Uh, let's go on and look at the particular issue of oil. We talked about how the growth of the gross national product in the United States was very tightly correlated with our growth in the use of energy. Seems to me that graph makes the point pretty clean. You need energy to make economies go. Here are other countries. This is per capita. Per capita. The, the total for the countries would be greater because the populations have been growing in most of these countries over time. Korea has been, as Korea became very, from very poor to quite rich, 
to a quite rich country, the per capita wealth increased from $2,000 to $8,000 per person per year. The energy consumption increased almost exactly one for one with that increase of wealth. Mexico, the same. Netherlands, more or less the same. Uh, they actually de decreased the efficiency of using energy, but they increased their wealth required an increase in the use of energy, apparently. U.S. is the only place it's different. And we think, we don't quite understand that. Either we are, in fact, more clever, and that's what everybody likes to say, um, but, you know, we don't make our steel so much in the United States anymore. We don't make it in Pittsburgh. We make it in Korea. We refine our oil in Mexico and Venezuela and Trinidad and so forth. So, um, but, these issues are, are very interesting, but if you extrapolate this, nevertheless, you find the United States is much less efficient at turning energy into wealth as are any of these other countries. Costa Rica is special. In Costa Rica, the population grew at exactly the same rate of the increase in the use of energy, and so they, their wealth did not grow at all. Now, while all this was going on, Europe needed resources. Here is a map of, of Africa. And with the exception of Ethiopia, you see all of Africa was carved up by the Belgians, who were the nastiest colonists, King Leopold, a horrible person, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, Spain. They said, we need resources. We need metals. We need, we need tropical crops. We need wood. We need timber. We need whatever, in the early days we need slaves, and they just went and took it. And that's of course what people originally did, the English and Dutch did in the Americas. Well, they didn't consider it bad, they thought it was a great thing to do. To me it's kleptocracy of a sort. Next. Um, <laughs> along, something else came along here, this is Henry Ford's first production plant. Mass production. What this did was enormously increase the rate at which we could exploit materials and turn them into products. Now, all of this is connected with the increased use of energy, increased use of steel, but this is an, another thing that's happening at the same time, generating this tremendous increase of wealth, as we saw in England and in the United States. I'm going to take a look now at the oil industry. Hope I have enough time. This is Colonel Drake's mill in Pennsylvania, not too far from New York, the first place oil was discovered. And it's the first time, well, the Chinese knew about oil 10,000 years ago, but this was the first place people realized they could punch a hole in the ground and get oil. And boy, have we been doing it. What's happened over time, however, is that we've been become much less effective in finding oil, with all of our new technology, uh, incidentally, this has got to be said in the context of our president saying, we're going to make ourselves not dependent upon others in providing oil. Right? That's what the president says. We're going to drill more in the United States and get more oil. But what's happened is we used to get somewhere around 500 barrels per foot that we would drill looking for oil. And up to about 1990, we went down and got only 10 barrels, 1 50th as much, with all the modern technology. And the point of this has been harder and harder in the United States to find oil. Now the question is, is this what's ahead of us, the end of cheap oil? There will always be oil. Maybe you could say there'll always be enough oil to oil your bicycle chain. The question is, is there going to be enough oil to run a huge modern civilization like ours? And that's, don't you think that's one of the most important questions that we could be asking right now about our future? About whether Simon is right or, or uh, Hansen is right? So let's take a look. How do we think about this? Uh, now this is for the United States. I, I, this is roughly my lifetime. I was born in 1943. I'll die sometime around 2020. And so this is a basic 
what's called the Hubbard curve, we'll talk a little more about that, of oil produced in the United States. Looks something like that. Natural gas, a little bit higher. Lots of coal, maybe. But the oil, hmm. That's Hubbard's view. Next. Um, Hubbard predicted in 1955 that the United States would peak in oil production in 1970. Everybody laughed at him. This is the actual data on oil production in the United States, and it's very, very similar. That's where we are now, folks, halfway down the other side. Here's Hubbard's curve for world oil production, peaking sometime around maybe 2008. A little bit hard to figure out exactly what that might be. People argue about it. But certainly it will happen in your lifetime. We'll go over the peak of global oil production. And that what we do find is offshore or deep or arctic or something, very expensive. And if something's expensive, it means energy intensive to develop. Next. All countries of the world, this happens to be Indonesia from 1970 to 1995, are greatly increasing their use of energy. So we're competing with the rest of the world for this whatever oil remains. Next. Pakistan. Who thinks about Pakistan as a huge user of energy? It is. Next. But the price of oil keeps going down, correcting for inflation. Not sure why that is. Certainly not giving us signals of scarcity. Maybe it's not going to be scarce. Next. Um, we hear a lot of talk now about the Arctic Wildlife Reserve, the oil that might be there, probably is there. This is sort of a Hubbard curve. Uh, it's, it's plotted on different axes, but here we have it. Uh, here's the consumption of oil in the United States up to the year 2000. And so we're, we're importing now about more than half of the oil we use. Now, here, if we find the oil we think that might be there, this is what it will mean for the future. Now, you can argue either that, oh my god, it isn't very much oil, and we're going to have to get off the, the oil teat anyway, or you can say, my god, it'll be half of what we'll be using, so we better go for it. So you can argue either way. Next. Okay, let's stop right there. Now, in this analysis, the critical guy who figured this out I think this man is maybe about number three or four on my list of best scientists that ever lived, is M. King Hubbard. And this curve is called a Hubbard curve. And he was the one who made accurate predictions about what oil would look like over time. But there's one resource that we basically used all up of. It's the highest quality coal, called anthracite coal. So maybe that's what's going on. Maybe Hubbard is right. I've done a lot of work on this, and I found with Cutler Cleveland, who was at one time my student, like you, who did a special project in, as a uh, senior, when he was a senior and I was his professor. That was published in Science and was reported on the first page of the Wall Street Journal. And what we had found was quite interesting. That the harder you drilled for oil, the less effective you were at finding it. Less efficient you were at finding it. Your barrels found per foot went way down when you drilled a lot. This was written up on the first page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Andy Warhol said everybody has 15 minutes of fame. This was my 15 minutes of fame on the first page of the Wall Street Journal. I didn't even know they wrote this article. And I came into my office and my secretary was going bonkers. She says, you can't believe what's going on. So here are the people that called me that morning based on my 15 Senator Bumpus's office, United States Geological Survey, um, McNeil-Lair report, 
uh, Wichita Eagle, uh, TASS News Agency, Wall Street Journal, Embassy of Kuwait. 20 or 30 of those came in that morning. And I had my 15 minutes of fame. And now everybody feels the market has solved the oil problem. Is that right or not? George Bush says all we got to do is throw more money at it. Drill more holes. Well, we've drilled three million holes. What are we going to get with the next couple hundred? Well, we're going to leave you at that. Bye, folks.